So the Sixth Circuit and Ninth Circuits have held that there is uh, not, or the courts do not have the discretion to afford the inmate the opportunity to amend the complaint. And then uh, the, the Fifth Circuit has held that uh, the inmates uh, d can be afforded that opportunity and indeed must generally be afforded that opportunity to, uh, uh, to amend the complaint. Now again, this is a question of great practical uh, import. Uh, as um, many of you have probably observed, prisoners do not typically draft their complaints, shall we say, artfully. I used to work for a, a clerk for a federal district judge and the brunt of my work uh, involved the processing of prisoner claims. And again, very often you will see inmates sue uh, parties who are not suable, they'll sue the state. Uh, very often there will be something, let's say with a medical claim, it looks like there's a, it, it could be that the prisoner uh, could um, prove the facts demonstrating deliberate indifference. But right now, uh, right, right now, in the face of the complaint, it looks like this is now more a claim of negligence. Or maybe the prisoner hasn't uh, included facts showing personal involvement of that particular defendant in the alleged constitutional provision. Again, this happens with a great deal of frequency. And, and very often, I, I've, I've watched a, a number of different district courts in different districts in the country, and very often the response has been uh, to give the prisoner uh, a chance to amend the complaint, depending on what that, the complaint actually looks like. And again, the question is, can you still do that? And the courts are divided on that, on that question. I don't understand the Ninth Circuit to have said you must dismiss the complaint. I thought it said you must dismiss the claim. Okay, I'm sorry. And yes. that's a very, and you are correct. And that's you are a major absolutely, difference. You are absolutely correct that on that, that claim, they, they do not have the opportunity to amend the claim. I'm sorry, I misspoke. The inmate does not have the opportunity to amend that claim. Correct. Any questions about that, the screening requirement of the PLRA? Okay, well then let's move on to the, the next hurdle that inmates must cross over. And that is known as the physical injury requirement. 42 U.S.C. section 1997EE -E says that no federal action may be brought by a prisoner who's confined in a correctional facility for mental or emotional injury suffered while in custody unless there is a prior showing of physical injury. So the inmate cannot sue for mental or emotional injury without that prior showing of physical injury. Now let me give you an example of a case where this physical injury requirement would apply. It's a real case where the correctional officer held a loaded gun in the prisoner's mouth for a period of time and the, uh, didn't shoot the prisoner, and so the prisoner sued, uh, claiming that that had constituted cruel and unusual punishment. He didn't suffer any physical injury. He was suing for the tra traumatic experience, and the physical injury requirement would foreclose that kind of claim. Uh, at least that would be the argument. The threshold question concerning the physical injury requirement is, is this requirement constitutional? And thus far, we have the D.C. Uh, uh, Court of Appeals and the Seventh Circuit holding that the provision is constitutional. The Seventh Circuit said, emphasized that it was holding that the provision was constitutional as applied in that particular case. And let me tell you about that particular case um, that came before the uh, Seventh Circuit. It was the Zayner case. Um, inmates uh, sued, claiming that they had been exposed to asbestos when working in the prison kitchen. So they were, they were um, suing, they wanted an injunction, and they also wanted damages uh, for their emotional and uh, mental injuries as they waited for years uh, to find out whether or not they were going to get uh, terminally ill from this exposure. They wanted to be compensated for that. And one of the questions before the Seventh Circuit was, does this physical injury requirement unconstitutionally restrict the remedies uh, available or the remedial relief that a court can award for a constitutional violation. The Seventh Circuit did say that there is a point where the restriction of remedial relief is tantamount to uh, a, a taking away of the rights themselves. But the court said and that, that, that when we reach that point, there would be a constitutional problem with the statute in question. But the Seventh Circuit said in this particular case, we hadn't reached that point. The inmates could still obtain an injunction to preclude their further exposure to the asbestos. And if they ever did get ill with 
with, from the exposure to asbestos, they could recover uh, damages for that, for that illness. The Seventh Circuit acknowledged that the inmates would not be fully compensated for in, the injuries they suffered for the years of wondering if they were going to die from the asbestos exposure. But the court basically reminded us and said that there are a lot of times when people do suffer uh, harm, but they are not fully, and, and even from a constitutional violation, but are not compensated for that harm. And we know that because of application of immunity doctrines. One of the most significant questions um, raised by this physical injury requirement is uh, what, what is the effect of this provision on constitutional violations that do not result in a physical injury? For example, uh, violation of religious religious freedom. If, if an inmate was not permitted to have a Bible in his cell uh, and he is suing for damages, is he foreclosed from bringing suit because there is no physical injury involved? Um, courts are divided on this question. And the Ninth Circuit and several of the district courts have held that the physical injury requirement does not bar suit in this particular situation. What they've said is this. They've said, well, the inmate who wasn't uh, permitted to have access to a, bi a Bible is not really suing for emotional injury. He's suing to vindicate a constitutional right. And that's really the major part of their analysis. And the only, I guess, um, question, I guess, that would be raised by that is, is that not always true when, it, when an inmate is filing uh, suit to seek redress for violation of a constitutional right, that they are uh, tr uh, seeking vindication of the constitutional right? So the, the result may be right of those courts, but it seems like there might be something more. Um, it may or may not be right, but it, might, it would seem that would, there would be something more uh, in the analysis. So we have some courts holding the physical injury requirement does not apply to that claim uh, of abridgment of religious freedom. We have other courts, some district courts, concluding that it does apply and that the inmate can only seek uh, an injunction so he can get access to that Bible in the future um, or could seek nominal damages but not compensatory. Now, the Seventh Circuit and a district court in the Southern District of New York have added a bit of a twist to, to this issue. And I've got the citation for the um, district court opinion here. Let me talk, though, about the Seventh Circuit case, because uh, it's quite interesting in light of the other second, Seventh Circuit case we talked about involving asbestos exposure. In this particular case, Robinson versus Page, the prisoners were suing because there was, uh, they, allegedly, there was lead in the water. And so they were seeking damages because uh, of, being, of their exposure to the lead in the water. The Seventh Circuit emphasized that this physical injury requirement only applies when the inmate is seeking compensation for emotional or mental injuries. And the Seventh Circuit said in this case, in that case before the court, that's not what the prisoner was seeking compensation for. He was seeking compensation for the physical effects of exposure to, to lead that cumulatively over time can have dramatically adverse uh, effects on the prisoner's health. And the uh, district court in New York had the same kind of analysis, dealing with asbestos exposure, but in this particular case, the inmates were suing not for emotional injury. They were suing because they're, they're, they ha there is this, um, uh, there's been this effect in their bodies. It may not manifest itself for a number of years, but they could be bring suit uh, despite this, this uh, physical injury requirement. The question is, does the physical injury requirement apply uh, when prisoners are seeking injunctive relief or declaratory relief? And thus far, the courts that have addressed this issue have said no, that it does not. Um, the 5th, 7th, 10th, and D.C. circuits. Does the physical injury requirement apply to uh, persons who have been prisoners who have now been uh, released? And they're seeking, uh, in other words, can they seek compensation for emotional and mental injuries not accompanied by a physical injury. The Seventh Circuit has concluded that the physical injury requirement does not apply to release prisoners. And they've done so largely because of the way in which the definition of uh, prisoners 
in the PLRA or in this part of the PLRA, uh, prisoner refers to persons incarcerated or detained in any facility uh, and who is accused of, et cetera, of a crime or, or uh, adjudicated delinquent for violations of criminal law, et cetera. So again, the Seventh Circuit is saying that physical injury requirement does not apply to release prisoners. Now, what that means, if, if that holding is correct, what that means as a practical matter is this. If a prisoner, uh, let's say the prisoner who uh, had a loaded gun stuck in his mouth, if he is released before the statute of limitations elapses, he can recover damages for uh, that violation, assuming it's cruel and unusual punishment. Whereas a prisoner who uh, was the victim of the same kind of conduct who is incarcerated and not released before the statute of limitations has run would not be uh, able to recover damages. There are some questions about uh, what is the physical injury that would support a claim for emotional or mental injuries? What, what does that mean? What, 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 what exactly is a physical injury? Now, something to note. Go back to the three strikes provision, and you will re recall that there is that proviso in the three strikes provision that says the inmate with three strikes can sue in form of papyrus if he faces an imminent threat of serious physical injury. There is a seriousness component to that proviso or exception. Here, when we're getting into the physical injury requirement, there is not that reference to uh, a serious physical injury. It just says that there has to be physical injury. Um, what does that mean? Well, in the district, uh, in the DC circuit, the court has said that uh, somatic manifestations of, emo uh, of emotional distress. An inmate says he's losing weight, he can't sleep uh, because of, of all these bad things that have happened to him. Um, does that satisfy the physical injury requirement? And that particular court is saying no. Um, in the Northern District of Texas, the court said that um, the following did not satisfy the physical injury requirement. A bleeding tongue, injured shoulder, minor abrasions on the arm and chest, contusions with sl slight swelling of the jaw, wrists that were red and swollen, and scratches to the face and nose. And there are a number of other cases listed in uh, the outline interpreting that physical injury requirement. Now, do you have any questions or comments about the physical injury requirement? You know, there is an argument in the, in the earliest days of the Republic court said, it didn't matter because it never applied to anybody in the old days, but that the Constitution was self-enforcing. Uh, uh, we got 1983, so that eliminated any question about the self-enforcing character of the Constitution. Uh, because, uh, as we know, once Congress speaks, that ends the, the federal common law. But where the Congress has now deprived the prisoner of a right to bring an action under the Constitution, as an example, because uh, religious freedom doesn't result in somatic change. Uh, I suppose we're now going to revive the question about whether the Constitution is self-enforcing. Right, right. There's a real fundamental question raised by the physical injury requirement. and. Um, Again, it, the, the Seventh Circuit did, did intimate that there would be a point or could be a point where the restriction of remedies does um, uh, and seems to be actually suggesting there is a self that it is self-enforcing. But in that particular case, well, they said the restriction did not go that far. There are lots of ancient cases that right. said that. Right, right. And certainly Bivens is, is based on that principle. Well, Bivens is based right. on that. Right, absolutely. Now, this is, in my opinion, and I've spent, um, oh, I can't say even hours. It seems like a lifetime uh, looking at these cases. I think this is tough stuff. I think it's very complicated stuff. And, and um, I think that I'm an educated person. Now, the question is, can prisoners understand all of these, these issues and complexities that we have been talking about? Um, in 1994, there was a study by the National Center for Education Statistics. It's a very sophisticated study found that seven out of every 10 prisoners operate at the lowest literacy levels, that they cannot 
uh, understand complex written materials. They certainly can't integrate them. Now, the next question is what happen happens if an inmate is so lucky as to cross over these hurdles and then crosses over all the other hurdles that people encounter when litigating a claim and the inmate actually wins? Well, the PLRA not only um, erects some obstacles for prisoners bringing suits, but it also does limit the remedial relief uh, that can be awarded prisoners. And there are two main types of restrictions. One is in the area of prospective relief. And we're, let's talk about uh, injunctions. At the time the PLRA was enacted, uh, states across the country had court orders in effect uh, uh, governing conditions in correctional facilities in states. Over 30 of the states had prisons uh, operating under court order and then the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, et cetera. And there is in the PLRA a provision that says that uh, if there is uh, a court order granting prospective relief in effect and there had been no finding, no finding by the court that the prospective relief was uh, necessary to correct the violation of a federal right, and that it was narrowly drawn, and that it was the least intrusive means of, of uh, correcting that violation. If there had not been that court finding, then the prospective relief uh, should be set aside. Now, there is a caveat or an exception to that terminate, termination provision, and that is that if the court now makes written findings that the relief, prospective relief is still necessary to remedy a violation of the federal right. It is no broader than necessary to correct the violation, is narrowly drawn, and is the least intrusive means of correcting that violation. Then the prospective relief will remain in effect. Um, one of the questions about the termination provision is, well, what does this mean as a practical matter? And that kind of depends on what the termination provision means by it, it. It says, if the court makes written findings based on the record that all of this is meant, what does the record mean? Well, if it means the record at the time the court's injunction was entered, then what that would mean is that court orders across the, across the country are going to be set aside, at least consent decrees. Because when consent decrees are entered into, there's not this kind of finding uh, by the court. Uh, in fact, correctional officials typically, they, they refuse to enter into a consent decree unless there's some kind of provision in the decree that says just by entering into this decree does not mean that we're violating the Constitution. Um, so if that's what record meant, uh, court, court orders across the country would be immediately set aside. But, but um, the alternative interpretation is that record, refer, based on the record, refers uh, to uh, you know, evidence that's been adduced and presented at a hearing. So the question is, does there have to be a hearing to determine whether or not the prospective relief is still needed and is nearly drawn, et, et cetera? Some of the circuits are saying that there is a right to such a hearing. Uh, and, uh, and, and for example, one of the courts mentioned, how, how would we possibly know whether or not the violation is current on, ongoing unless we have, unless we have such, such a hearing? One, one part of the termination provisions that, that really has not become the focus of litigation yet, I think we're in the first round of PLRA litigation, but something that's going to come up, I think, is this. Un under the PLRA, if the court denies the termination motion, because it found, finds that this exception applies, under the PLRA, the prison officials have to wait a year, but then they can come back in again with another motion to terminate. And what that means as a practical matter is this. If we're going to have a hearing each time there's such a motion, there's going to be really ongoing litigation. Uh, basically, each year, the court will be reexamining whether or not there's a constitutional violation, whether or not uh, the relief is, is narrowly ta tailored, et cetera. Now, there, there's been a lot of litigation regarding the constitutionality of the uh, termination provision. And one of the questions about, uh, that's come up, one of the constitutional issues is, does it impinge upon uh, or, or does it violate separation of powers? And again, there are a lot of uh, different arguments 
that have been asserted by prison advocates uh, as to why they believe it impinges upon separation of po powers. But one of the issues is this. Does the termination provision unconstitutionally reopen a final judgment? There's a Supreme Court case, Plout versus Spendthrift Farm, Inc. In, and what had happened, um, kind of the history leading up to that case, the Supreme Court had interpreted uh, a, a, a statute uh, of limitations dealing with um, securities uh, litigation. Uh, and, and the court had interpreted this uh, statute of limitations in such a way that it led to the dismissal of a plaintiff's uh, case. Congress disagreed with the way in which the court had interpreted the statute of limitations. So Congress passed a statute uh, clarifying what it believed had always been the statute of limitation and directing the courts to reopen all those cases that had been dismissed because of limitations problems. So now the case or issue comes before the Supreme Court. Does this congressional statu statute directing courts to now reopen those cases, uh, does that statute impinge on separation of powers? And the court concluded that it did, that Congress was unconstitutionally requiring the courts to reopen a final judgment. So the issue concerning the PLRA and the termination provision is does the termination provision unconstitutionally require the federal courts or, or federal court to reopen a final a final judgment. The circuits thus far that have addressed this issue have distinguished Plout, but they've they've distinguished it for different reasons. Once again we have a, a difference in, in, in reasoning, which we're, because of the difference in reasoning on this and the three strikes issue, I, I do wish that the issues could get to the Supreme Court so we could get uh, uh, some helpful clarification. But Two of the circuits, the 4th and 11th circuits, have said, now wait a second, this is different with the PLRA because we're talking about having the courts re-examine an injunction. And that's different because in Plout, the, the case involved uh, damages only. And these two circuits have said an injunction is not a final judgment. And the reason why it's not a final judgment, according to these courts, they say these injunctions, sometimes they last, it seems like, forever. They're 20, 25 years, 30 years, and they change over time. They can change over, over time. So they are not a final judgment. Um, now, if that reasoning is correct, it may be, it may not, but if it is correct, what that means is that a bill that's passed the House twice now is constitutional as far as this separation of powers issue. Uh, this is called the delay amendment. Again, it was passed last year by the House and it was also passed in June uh, uh, again and is now in the, in the, in the Senate. And basically what this bill would do is set aside any consent decree that was in effect at the t time the PLRA was enacted, period. In other words, the delay amendment would set aside uh, consent decrees, for example, in the prison area, even if conditions in the prison are still unconstitutional, and even if prison officials want the consent decree to remain in effect. But if those circuits are correct that an injunction is not a final judgment, then this is okay as far as that part of the Constitution is concerned. So this is a piece of uh, legislation that you might want to keep an eye out for because uh, this may be something that you're going to confront with, uh, confront down the road. Now the... Um, there is the Rufo problem. Well, it, it, there's, there's um, the comment that there is the Rufo problem. Now, if what, what you refer to as a Rufo problem is that in a Supreme Court case called Rufo versus inmates of Suffolk County, the court said there um, that a, a consent decree, I don't have the exact language here, but basically said that a consent decree is a final judgment, period. But what the Fourth and Eleventh Circuits have responded, they've said, well, it's a final judgment for some purposes, but not for other purposes. And for separation of power, powers purposes, it is not a final judgment. As to prospective relief. Yes, yes. Um, some of the other circuits that have upheld the termination provision, these, these circuits have held, well, uh, 
an injunction or, or prospective relief, um, that it is a final judgment, but that it can be modified to the extent equity requires. And because of this change in the law due to the PLRA, because of the termination provision, equity requires that uh, courts re-examine uh, these, these orders that they have previously, previously entered. You view that these are private rights in these consent decrees uh, that are uh, entered into between inmates and a Department of Corrections. If the rights are considered to be, these federal rights are to be considered private rights, then clearly uh, the Wheeling, West Virginia case, which dealt with public rights, and allowed a consent decree to be set aside would not apply. I wonder what the holdings that are coming down in this area will do to consent judgments generally. Well, all right, a couple points. First of all, there was a mention by the judge of there is another separation of powers issue raised. In fact, there are several others raised by the termination provision. And one is, one is whether, um, it's, that brings up the wheeling issue, is whether or not the, the Congress is basically dictating the result in a case without changing the, the underlying law. And the response of the circuits that have, have found that there is not that, that kind of separation of powers problem, they're saying, well, Congress has changed the under, uh, underlying law. They've just changed the court's remedial authority. And they've also said that um, Congress isn't dictating a result because the courts must still go through this process of, of deciding um, whether or not the relief is still necessary to remedy the violation, et cetera. Now, your, what you have brought up is that there is language in the Wheeling case that, sa that seems to su suggest that, that generally setting aside even the, the prospective relief would create separation of pro powers problem. There it didn't because it dealt with a public right. With a private right, it would. So, so again, Clearly, if that proposed legislation to which you referred a moment ago in the House were to become law, there'd be a, an effective argument, it seems to me, for separation of powers application. Well, I think one of the values of this amendment is it does help to crystallize um, the, constitutional, the constitutional issues. The purpose of, uh, of declaring it unconstitutional? I'm so, in, in terms of, for example, determining whether prospective relief is uh, a final judgment, and also whether um, this uh, argument that um, it is a final judgment, but it can be the, the, uh, the, the judgment can be reexamined to the extent equity requires, and equity requires it because of the change in the law. Well, this would be a change in the law. In the uh, Sixth which, Circuit, our, uh, in the Sixth Circuit, they attempt to get around that by saying, but that question always remains with the judiciary, so that if that legislation to which you made reference, I forget what the House bill number is, were to become law, it seems to me it would be uh, a slam dunk for a separation of powers uh, right. Right. decision. So one of, one of the questions that, or points that's been made by the judge is, you know, is where are we going from here, not just in terms of legislation, but what, but what are the uh, implications of, of the termination provisions, and right now the law is 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 terminating um, consent decrees and court orders in the prison area, subject to this caveat. And the reality is, if this is constitutional, then we could have similar legislation uh, in in any other area of the law. So it, it is another yet another level of problem, which is the consent decrees take uh, have a contractual component to them, and the question is whether or not Congress can consistent with the Constitution and their contractual agreement made by the litigant. Right, right. So be, uh, the, the judge's point is that beyond the separation of powers issue, there are some com complicated due process issues as, as well. Does the, do the inmates have a vested right in this, in this consent decree to which they've contracted? Um, and uh, does, does now requiring them to basically reprove their case and maybe even every year uh, uh, unconstitutionally, <clears throat> excuse me, impinge on that constitutional right. Now, I had mentioned that there were two restrictions in terms of the remedial relief awarded to inmates. And the other area where there, we see restrictions is in the attorney's fees. There are a number of restrictions on attorney's fees that can be awarded uh, prisoners uh, in, in these kinds of cases when they prevail. 
And I think the, the two that are, are the most important or the most significant would be number three and number four. Um, basically, what no, the, the restriction referred to uh, in number three is that the defendant can be required to pay only uh, attorney's fees that would be 150% of the monetary judgment. So if the inmate uh, receives $100 in damages, the most attorney's fees that the defendant can be required to pay would be $150. And again, you've, you've had a lot of prisoner cases, I imagine, in your court. You may not have had a lot go to trial, but you do know that very often if they do win, they, don't, they, they often won't win big. Um, they will, the monetary relief will often be small. So this can have a dramatic effect on the attorney's fees that are awarded. And then also there are restrictions on the maximum hourly rate that can be awarded for attorney's fees. The bottom line is this, is that when you do all the math, the most that could be awarded in attorney's fees, at least in some districts in the country, would be $112.50. The Judicial Conference has authorized in 93 of the 94 districts uh, $75 uh, an hour for um, uh, work under the Criminal Justice uh, Act, and that's kind of the guiding light for the uh, award of attorney's fees under the PLRA. But here's the catch. Congress hasn't uh, appropriated funds to actually impl implement uh, this, this kind of award across the country. Uh, so Congress has only appropriated funds to permit uh, attorneys under the CJA to receive $65 for in-court work and $45 for out-of-court work. So what that means as a practical matter is that in many, di many districts are looking at the appropriated funds and they're saying that attorneys representing these prisoners at most can get $97.50 for their in-court work and $67.50 for out-of-court work. For some attorneys that would be a significant reduction in what, sh what they would typically have been have been awarded. I, I did want to um, tell you briefly about the, the impact of the PLRA. The question is, you know, we've seen all of these restrictions and what, as a practical matter, what, what, what has that meant to the courts? And before the PLRA was enacted, prisoner, the number of prisoner uh, suits filed was increasing dramatically. Between 1980 and 1995, uh, the number of suits went up 227 percent, but during that same time period, the number of state prisoners went up 237 percent. So the per capita rate was actually declining. But the point is, the number of civil rights suits was going up enormously. Now, let's look and see what's happened with the, the PLRA. Um, I've got the pre-PLRA figure. This was the number filed in 1995 by state prisoners. Uh, 1998. We see a 30, by 1998, we have seen a 37 percent decrease in the number of civil rights suits filed by state prisoners. And what's a bit remarkable about that, or striking about that statistic, is that at the same time, the number of state prisoners has gone up 13 percent. Uh, is that both state and federal courts? This is the, no, oh, no, this is just federal court, the federal district. It's just but federal. In, but in Michigan, state claims, state prison claims are going up. Yes, okay, and again, um, so we may have uh, this dramatic reduction in the federal courts, but we're, but we're now seeing uh, many more lawsuits filed in state courts. Now, in some states, though, they're, they are parroting the PLRA. They're adopting their own v versions of the P, uh, state PLRA, so it may be over time that will spread across, across the country. It has been my pleasure and honor to talk to you today about the Prison Litigation Reform Act. I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in Baltimore. And again, I encourage you to come up here and talk with me after the session. Thank you very much.